the connection between Ukraine and Canada is deep, goes back decades, over a century. Uh, Canadians want to be there uh, for Ukrainians, and we will be there for them. We Events, dear boy, events. That's what drives the world of foreign affairs, and events have been unfolding over the last little while that we may but may not have expected just even a few short months ago. Hi, I'm Brian Lilly, political columnist with the Toronto Sun, joined by Conservative leadership candidate Jean Charest. And, and uh, Mr. Charest, I want to ask you, um, the uh, you know, Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, gave an impassioned speech to the Canadian parliament. I'm sure you felt it was moving, but he kept asking for one thing that it doesn't seem uh, Western countries are willing to do, and that's close disguise. Your reaction to his speech and... What can NATO, Canada, our allies realistically do? Well, what's, what's happening in Ukraine is heartbreaking, nothing short of it. All of us, every day, I mean, we all watch the news with, uh, with a, a, a very strong sentiment that uh, we need to support the, the people from Ukraine. And what President Zelensky is, is doing is asking for the rest of the world really to to step up and to be there. And uh, and Canada is part of that. I, we have to do our share, which includes sending weapons and lethal weapons, which includes financial support, which includes bringing in refugees and uh, in numbers that justify it, especially given the fact that we have a high number of Canadians who are of Ukrainian origin. And, uh, and in this case, uh, we are gonna to have to continue to work very closely with our allies. Uh, our NATO allies. Canada cannot act alone on this. And, uh, and that's, that's, I think, the, the first order of business. The other thing we should look at, Brian, is increasing the sanctions. Maybe we, we need to just go totally in on sanctions on, uh, on Russia. And uh, if I were prime minister, that's exactly what I would be looking at. Further sanctions, even more, more profound, more important than what uh, is there now, is we increase aid and increase military aid. There's been a lot of unity in Canada on support for Ukraine, opposition to Vladimir Putin. That's not the case on all issues. I mean, even I've been complimentary of the prime minister doing a lot of what I and you know the, the current conservative leadership have called for. But on other foreign affairs issues, I, I feel that he's been on the wrong side. In fact, going back to when they first came in, they wanted to warm up relations with Russia re-engage with Iran without getting concessions. They, they had a, a very rose-colored glasses view of the world in foreign affairs. And, and it just seemed to be, well, if Stephen Harper did A, we're going to do B. Where do you draw foreign policy differences with the current government? How would you be handling the world stage differently? And do you have a trunk full of costumes that you take with you when you travel? <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have the costumes. And, and by the way, you allude to something that's important. On foreign affairs, it, it, it's not as though we always have to disagree. And, and when we leave the shores of Canada, you know, there's unwritten rules that we should, uh, we should you know, keep our internal stuff at home. And, and when we're abroad, uh, avoid criticizing each other. That being said, the problem, I, the big issue for Canada is that we're missing in action in a lot of parts of the world. Uh, Brian, whether it's Africa, the Middle East, even Asia. I mean, uh, and I'm, you know, I was very involved. I'm the, uh, I'm the honorary chair of the Canada ASEAN Business Council. We were instrumental in, uh, in encouraging and promoting a trade negotiations between Canada and ASEAN. This is very timely, by the way. I mean, it's just been launched a few months ago. Why? We need to diversify our trade from China in particular and, and have some redundancy if we're going to avoid being dependent on, on, one, on another superpower. And so there's intelligent things we should be doing. But frankly, Brian, when Mr. Trudeau said Canada's back, I didn't see it. I didn't see it at all. And I think in, in a number of places in the world, uh, others expected us to be uh, there and to step up. In Western Africa, the French took the responsibility of dealing with uh, Al-Qaeda. Canada, I don't think Canada carried its share of the load in that part of the world where we could have very well in the last few years had a much stronger presence in supporting that operation of the French government to fight off Al-Qaeda. Let, let me ask you about dealing with Washington, D.C. When Donald Trump wanted to renegotiate NAFTA and was talking about protectionist measures, Trudeau government went all in. Now, I felt like they should have had a stronger 
outcomes that they wanted to get, the stronger goals set for that trade deal. And, and to me, they, it felt like they were on the defensive against Trump. People don't realize Canada has been very rough in the United States. Everyone thinks of Canada as being wonderful, and so do I. I love Canada. But they've outsmarted our politicians for many years. But they took it seriously, and yeah. they made a serious effort. When Biden came in, he's even more protectionist than Donald Trump. And they seem to, as one Washington observer said to me, seems like the Trudeau guys fell asleep on uh, at, at the switch. This is one of the easiest relationships that you can have as an American president, one of the best. So uh, how would you deal with Washington? There's a lesson that you're, uh, you're alluding to without naming it. When we did the Kuzma NAFTA negotiations, we went all in with the provinces, the private sector. We went all in with municipal uh, P people. In other words, if we want to defend ourselves in the United States, the tried formula that gets us the best results is when everyone in Canada is on the same team working with all our counterparts at every level. And the United States, Brian's a superpower, by the way. I mean, let's not, they're friends, they're allies. We're very lucky to live next door to them. And uh, we live in a great neighborhood, if you look at it from that point of view. But that, never lose sight of the fact that they, uh, they, you know, are a superpower and they behave like a superpower, which means that it requires special attention to avoid being collateral damage on American policy like by America. We are collateral damage. And, uh, and they're, they're aiming at us. China and elsewhere, and we're, we're taking the shrapnel. We, we, we take the hit. And, uh, but we do have, we do have things that uh, the other, other uh, countries in the world, including the United States, want. For example, strategic minerals. If we're going to have batteries, if we're going to have electric cars, you know what? You need strategic minerals. Well, guess who has them? Canada has. We have to learn how to negotiate in regards to what our core interests are, as opposed to just following along. And, and that's going to require some experience and some, uh, and some firmness with our allies, not hostility, but just, you know, being, we need to be businesslike. Keystone XL is a very good example. Can, you know, can you believe today with everything that's happening that the Americans are not doing this project? I mean, it doesn't make sense for them. Certainly doesn't make sense for us, but that points to the importance for us to not, you know, to be uh, working with the Americans, but avoid being as dependent as we are. We have to always diversify our trade to be successful and prosper. All right, Jean Charest, thank you very much. Let us know what you think. Drop a comment down below, share this on social media, and don't forget to subscribe.